1159 at Radio Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with Music and the Truth Until Dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. <laughs> Hey, welcome everybody to a uh, special edition, I guess, to the Daily Gun Show, or an update on the uh, Big Sandy Machine Gun Shoot uh, series that we've been doing on our gun website's YouTube channel for a long time. Uh, tonight, we've got Trevor joining us from the Big Sandy Machine Gun Shoot, a shoot that's been going on for the last 15 years here in Arizona. Uh, twice a year, a bunch of people get together to enjoy their um, recreational uh, pursuits at uh uh, belt fed tripod mounted full auto uh, machines and uh, it's a safe fun super exciting uh, event that happens twice a year and it's about to happen again it happens every march and every october and we've been going for a few years now a long time actually get up there whenever we can getting close but uh, we want to let people know about the shoot ahead of time and not just talk about it afterwards so we talked to the to the guys and uh, Trevor's joining us. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Now you're also in Arizona, I suppose. I don't. I, I don't think we've met, but I'm sure we've seen each other. So I'm sure we'd recognize each other. Yeah, no, I'm I'm coming from Arizona too. So, so we're we're talking about a machine gun shoot that happens twice a year. It's been going on since well for many years. We'll talk about that, but uh, it's about what halfway between I like to say halfway between Phoenix and Las Vegas, kind of out in the middle of nowhere in, in Arizona. And because of that location, it's a unique shoot. So um, I think, Trevor, you're here to tell us about it. So why don't you introduce yourself, tell us about the shoot. And we, this is an effort in interactive communication so that people that are watching us live be part of the conversation. Feel free to ask questions and uh, we ask for clarifications and we'll talk about the shoot here. So tell us about the shoot, where it started, about yourself. Yeah, sure. Said, so, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Trevor. Uh, so the shoot, it actually kind of started back in the mid eighties as just kind of a bunch of friends and people that had machine guns getting together and, and enjoying the machine guns that they, they owned. And it was, it was kind of up in Northern Arizona at the dry Creek is where it was. And after a while, they kind of knew that it was, it was getting bigger and they were going to need to find another place to do it because they were doing it on public land so in 2004 or so they they started an llc and and they went and purchased a large property just outside of wikia as you mentioned essentially yeah, in between phoenix and in las vegas and then they started doing the shoot there and that gave them a little more control and freedom as far as what the what they were doing and what they could do up there being that it was it was now a private property so, and, and what the land we're talking about isn't like a, a lot in a in a in a in a in a in the center or something. Like how big is the area, do you know? Uh I don't know exactly how I wanna say it's it's several hundred acres and I, I think they've they own the lot and then I wanna say they lease the land around it too. Um that way they can kind of just ensure that the safety of the whole thing with what they're doing and uh making sure that nobody's nobody's out there as much as possible so but it really it really allows them to to get out there and, and do all kinds of stuff that they they enjoy doing and in the range uh you can go out to 1200 yards is how, how deep that range is so you got plenty of room to stretch those legs of those machine guns out there Oh, muted here. So 1,200 yards is kind of deceptive. I would have thought it's even longer because when you're, it kind of goes down, you, you're on the one side of a hill and then it goes down and then up. So you certainly get to see everything that you're shooting. It's not like you're shooting, you know, up a hill or something. So you've got lots of visibility and with those aerial targets and stuff, I'm sure. Man, yeah, just, definitely. Yeah. That uh, the fire line is a little elevated over, over the majority of what you're doing. So it's nice because, yeah, like you said, you can definitely uh, see how far you're you're shooting out there and it allows you to, to really kind of get out there a little bit more. And, and the big backdrop of the, the mountain essentially behind it uh, allows them to do that. Uh, the aerial shoots for those targets that they got flying by. 
So when we're we're, we're seeing a machine gun shoot, I don't know if people get a scale. So we've got you know setting between Vegas and and Phoenix. So kind of if people haven't driven that before, there's not a lot between there. Uh, so it's fairly remote as far as you can get a couple hours away from a couple mm. of main. And then uh, they ha you have a lot of room there, and it's got terrain so that you're we're private, like at the range there when we're shooting. Uh, we're in a basin, I guess you could say. So even though we're noisy, most of that noise is going up. So we're not disturbing it. too many people, if there are people around there, I suppose. But uh, uh, the line is, what, a quarter mile long? Like the, the there's a probably like 12 foot long like slot for each, each like bay for each person, uh, each group. Yep. And a couple of them have a couple, like maybe two spots or more. But for the most part, that's individual entities, individuals, uh, clubs, friends that rent a spot on the firing line that's what, 12 by 12 or something? And there's a quarter mile of those. So how many shooters do you have here usually? Uh, yeah, yeah. the uh, the firing line's about a quarter mile long. And, and yeah, each each shooting position, if you will, is uh, 12 by 12 or 10 by 10, something like that. Uh, and, and yeah, so groups can rent one or two and they kind of sort that out once they get all the registrations in as, as far as where people go and stuff. But generally speaking, uh, bringing in about 300 shooters per shoot and a couple thousand spectators that are coming out to kind of check everything out. And we're talking, I'm kind of thumbing through some of the pictures on the website. We've got a link to the website out there. Uh, and then you click on the gallery and you can go into, well, they've been doing the shoot twice a year for decades. Well, for well decades. So yeah, yeah. Lots, and lots of pictures out there, but uh, the pictures here are the easiest ones to find. And we're kind of thumbing through to find a picture of the firing line and we're seeing some of the, the boosts that we're talking about. Uh, this is from the, uh, looks like from the far west end of the line, uh, looking east at night. And somebody had a long exposure, it looks like. So you can see just all the fun stuff. The tracers going off, some of the explosions. Or no, wait a minute. This is on the east side looking west, huh? This is way up on the hill. And these are all the tracers coming from the right. And these are all the explosions going off over on the left, huh? Yeah, so that'd be from the from the east side, yeah. Yeah, way up on the east side. So this is a really long uh, firing line that's on this hill here. And we're shooting south, basically. So kind of shooting towards Phoenix, although it's hundreds of miles this way, probably. Um, yeah. And this is way up on the hill. And this is where some of the spectators can see just a great bird's eye view now, it doesn't quite look like this because it's animated at night. This is a time lapse. So you're seeing an accumulation of a bunch of stuff. But this would all be happening, I mean, kind of randomly. But as a one of the aerial targets will go by, I mean, it'll have like waves of just impressive <laughs> ordnance happening. So I'm still trying to find a picture just to show how big the firing line is. But I guess when you see uh, an APC next to a tank with plenty of room on both sides and and what the, the distance they're shooting, and what this was the one where you had like the... The meth lab or something out there that year uh or something looks like out there. I yeah I don't, I don't remember i and i can't see the pictures that you're looking at either oh, oh okay. so i'm looking at a picture of the tank from 2018 and i'm guessing i'm thinking the early one just because it doesn't look very cold was october warm this year uh yeah it wasn't too bad um, everybody's wearing, no, nobody's wearing jackets in this one but it's with the big big tank and it looks like they're shooting at like a camper or something out on the hill yeah, I think that yeah, we've we've definitely put a few vehicles up there the last year or so, um, and uh, there's some like big Connex boxes that have been up there too. Mm. That uh, oh, shoot we're using as targets. And that's another neat thing. Like, you, there's no way to do that kind of stuff. I mean, you can theoretically do that kind of stuff on private land, but it would be, you know, it would be kind of overstepping a welcome to do all that stuff on private land, not be able to clean it up. So doing this on private land is ideal, and you can just take it to an extreme that's i don't know there's there's really nothing that compares with the big sandy shoot is there no i i don't think so as far as the scale of of the shoot and how many people are there and and as you mentioned the firing line and the distances you can shoot and um yeah the targets are out there with the vehicles and they just stay out there and just keep shooting them up now this is not neat one i'm just thumbing through the pictures from 2018 just to put it in scale there's 387 pictures just from the 2018 well one of the galleries so i'm guessing there's a gallery from the uh mark shoot also but they had the uh, bald turret and i've never seen that set up so they had a bald turret kind of on a scaffolding set up so that you could drop down into the bald turret and you could shoot from it right they were allowing people to shoot from it 
Yeah, yeah. Um, they they brought that out there last time, and that was definitely very cool. I, uh, two two uh, M two fifty caliber machine guns in there, and, and yeah, they were allowing uh, uh, people to go ahead and and get in there and shoot from that thing. So it, it was pretty cool. I don't I don't think it's going to be out there this time, but uh, it was definitely kind of cool. And you kind of never know what's going to be out there uh, when That's you head up there. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, and there's not it's not possible even i mean i'm guessing because you guys haven't but i'm just guessing it's not possible nobody tells you what they're bringing out there so if somebody brings out a ball turret and sets it up they might be the first time you know about it too right and yeah up. um yeah and i i don't think i think there was um with that ball turret i think it'd been kind of mentioned but they weren't really sure if that was going to work out or not and then it showed up and uh and there it was, and it, it was definitely kind of a cool thing to see, and and definitely very unique. I mean, I don't know where else you would see that or be able to use that. So, I, I mean, I've been to a couple of museums. I don't even think I've seen a ball turret removed from a plane like that. You know, that's in working order, or even just in a junkyard. Let alone yeah. it's set up at a place where you can shoot it. Let alone it not be in blanks and actually be able to shoot live rounds into the side of a hill. Yep, for sure. That's the Second Amendment right there. So now we're looking at uh, one of the slides from last year. And this is a pretty good indication of what the campground area looks like. And I'm surprised it's been a couple of years, I guess, since I've been up there. You've certainly improved. looks like you took a scraper and scraped up the whole uh, camping area. So it's nice and level. Um, and, you know, you can get a pretty good idea here. This is on the west end of the parking area. Looking east, the firing line is up the hill to the right here. And everybody who's spectators or just wants to hang out for the day uh, can park down here. It's no charge or anything. Uh, and then... Uh, is it, what's twenty five dollars still to be a spectator? Uh, thirty dollars for spectators, and that's for for all weekend. All weekend, uh, three days. Yeah, park, really. If you want to stick around, uh, and and you get you find a spot, a spot set up, you can see uh, lots of people bringing campers. Bob brought his camper out here one year. Uh, you've got porta potties out there. Firewood usually if it's cold, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's um. There might be somebody selling firewood. I don't know, but yeah, there's there's plenty of space to uh, to go out there and camp. And yeah, if you want fires, um, with it all being private property, uh, it's go out there, set up a fire, camp wherever. No, don't charge for camping or anything like that. Uh, we did we did get that all graded out there, so it's definitely a little little more user friendly for for setting up those campsites than just kind of the open desert that it was previously. Which was kind of part of the experience. I've been out there for the day. I've been out there car camping. I've been out there in the camper in a fifth wheel. Uh, haven't been out there. Haven't been out there. I think I might have even been out there in the van. So um, that's part of the experience. So this is unlike any other firearms experience in that in the respect that because it's so remote and because it's so authentic, you're not going to stay at a hotel. Well, I guess it's possible to stay at a hotel, but you'd be doing a lot of traveling. I think the nearest hotels are probably Kingman, Arizona, or Wiki up, or no, I guess Wickenburg, which are hour plus away and get filled up i mean there I, we have tried to look at hotels before and they people know that the events come in and they people that want to use a hotel they they uh reserve them so um, yeah i i think there's a couple there might be some in wiki up i'm not sure uh but yeah kingman would definitely be the, the closest thing and it's it's about 45 minutes so if if people didn't want to do the camping thing uh you know the 45 minute drive back to kingman it really isn't too bad and uh, there's definitely hotels available out there in kingman yep and then and that's pretty much highway there's a little bit of off-road uh to get from the road that goes between uh, wiki up and, and kingman to uh the shoot but it's not bad and i'm guessing because this is so scraped you've probably been working on that road well the roads there's people live out there so the roads aren't they're only bad really if it's really bad rain right yeah the uh it is it is dirt roads but it's it is maintained um as much as possible and, and yeah that's the only issue possibly is if there's a big rain just before there and i know it's been raining a lot so it it definitely has been wet up there but uh hopefully in the next week or so it's, it'll dry out i mean in arizona dries out pretty quick as as we know so it should be fine by next weekend for for the and, shoot and really it's just the wash to get in i mean there's the roads themselves once you get past the wash are fine again so yeah, the big issue is, I mean, if the if the river that you got across to get in there, the Big Sandy River is is flowing at all, uh, then you kind of you might have to go a long way around. But uh, but yeah, it's it's mm. nothing nothing crazy. I mean, we've we've brought big tour buses in, um, big fifth wheel trucks and and things like that. So it's it's no 
uh, no issue f- for getting vehicles back there. Yeah, we've gone out there in rentals, cars, and uh, I'm guessing people probably rent those you uh, the campers sometimes. Yeah, no, we definitely uh, like the Cruise America campers and stuff. Yeah, people come out in those sometimes and uh, drive those out there. So, and then as far as food, the 4-H usually sets up and has breakfast, lunch, and dinner for everybody. Yep the uh, the only food on site is that 4-H, uh, and they do breakfast, lunch, and dinner for everybody. And that's that is all the proceeds for that go to the 4-H of Kingman. So the uh, that's that's all a fundraiser for them. And, and that's kind of why we keep it that way to where that's the only food because we're kind of trying to push people to, to do that fundraiser uh, and help them out. And, and they do a good job, and it's, it's definitely yeah. worth your money. <laughs> Nobody has ever complained. I've never heard anybody complain about the food. In fact, I've, I know people that, you know, that's one of the things I look forward to is eating up there. Yeah, no, they, they do a good job, and uh, uh, they, put a, they put a lot in it and give you a decent meal for what you're paying for. Now we're looking at a great one. So this must have been somebody who took a drone up. I think the last time I was there, there was a drone flying almost nonstop. So somebody got a great shot of the firing line, uh, a chunk of the firing line. This isn't even the whole firing line. This is, the, this is about a half of the firing line, honestly. Um, but it's a great aerial view. And you can see that in a prior shot, we looked at the campground down below, and we said the firing line was up on the hill. Well, the people that are there shooting, they camp up on top with their guns. Uh, on, so there's like two separate camping areas, I guess you could say. And uh, and this is showing some of their campers and then the firing line with their pop-up tents and then the huge, I guess, is it wash? I don't know, whatever that like valley is. And then the other hillside, the opposing hillside where all these targets are set up. And this is a great shot because you don't really, at night you see the explosions and all the fun stuff, but it doesn't give you any idea of the scale. And uh, now we'll have to talk about the idea that somebody can come up there and rent a spot on the line now. That wasn't always... A thing and I don't think and then I mean just imagine if let's stop and talk about that is that still possible can people get a spot on the line yeah absolutely uh, registration usually uh, they usually get the forms out there maybe a, a month or two prior to the shoot uh, and then they're usually due about a month before the shoot but uh, but yeah any anybody can that wants to register and come out there and shoot they can uh, I, I believe spots are, are assigned based off of seniority, if you will. Right. Like, so if you've been coming for a while, but uh, and I, I do think they're typically selling out, but it, it, it's going to be seniority and then uh, when they're received. So, but yeah, there's no, uh, you don't got to be part of a club or anything like that. Anybody that's, that wants to come out and run a spot on the line, they're, they're welcome to do that. I'm going to pause for just a second and narrow cast to GMA on the Instagram. I'm simulcasting this on Instagram live. Uh, GMA says, I'd love to chat with you about my experience with the growth and expansion of the term assault rifle since 1976 here in the United States. And it has nothing to do with what we're talking about here, but that's one of my interests lately. So definitely uh, GMA, thanks for that. And uh, you know, message me over on Insta- Insta- or Insta- Instagram. And I'll get with you on that because that's something I'm definitely interested in exploring. But uh, back to the idea of shooting on the line. So, okay, so I've been going for a long time to the shoot. And when I started going, I knew a, a few people, a bunch of people actually that were set up there. So I had lots of uh, time or I had lots of experience shooting there. And and that's the treat because it's not an open to the public. I mean, it's just because you're a spectator. It's not like an open invitation to shoot somebody's private guns, right? You're able to stand near them as they're shooting their property, and it's an experience, and it's certainly awesome. Uh, but again, it's not an, an open, a welcome invitation, and, and these things cost a lot of money, and people are are there for their you know their enjoyment. You get it to experience it, but again, you, uh, being able to shoot is a is a, just a treat. So uh, if you're thinking about something like this and you're thinking about going, I'd highly recommend uh, thinking about getting a spot on the line or at least attempting to. Uh, not only are you going to be shooting on a quarter mile uh, line, a firing line that's on private property with the largest private machine gun shoot in the world uh, that's got a tradition and a history and you're going to be part of that, but what they're shooting at is 55 gallon buckets of dynamite and aerial ex- fireworks. So you're, I don't know any other place in the world where you're going to be able for just a couple of bucks to be able to rent a spot on the line and have an opportunity with each time you pull the trigger to have you know, a good shot and you know where they're at 
to have a freaking piece of dynamite go off. So let's talk about the the targets. So we've we've yeah. talked about the shoot and the, the the location and its history a little bit, but we're talking about a shoot where you shoot tripod mounted belt fed machine guns or anything you want really. But what are we shooting at, at Big Sandy? Yeah, so there there are some pieces uh, of of steel, if you will, out there. Some big, heavy duty steel that are kind of permanent targets, and some fifty five gallon drums and stuff like that. And uh, the cars, as we talked about earlier, and some large storage containers. So those are kind of those are the non reactive targets, if you will, that are out there. But uh, we they we also put out a bunch of reactive targets, which are both, as you mentioned, uh, sticks of dynamite. There's definitely some big. Uh, big containers, if you will, of tannerite that we're putting out there. So during the day shoot, the fireworks aren't out. We save those fireworks for, for the night shoots, mostly uh, Saturday night. But all the, the sticks of dynamite are put out there on essentially just wooden stakes. And so they're all they're all marked. You can you can see them for the most part. And yeah, you just you get an opportunity to shoot that and it's definitely you know when you hit one, that's for sure. <laughs> it's awesome. And, and not to mention the planes. So there's, uh, I, I guess it must be at this point a part of the shoot, but that that that's an individual who comes out with, I mean, I think I asked him one time, and he said dozens of remote-controlled aircraft and uh, flies them around during the day to shoot at, and then at night flies them around with glow sticks on them. Yeah, so, we, yeah, we've got those, those aerial targets, and... Uh, he he's up there every time, and yeah, he's he's a part of the shoot because that's definitely one of the uh, one of the perks of coming up there and being a part of this is where do you get to shoot at a flying target? But uh, but yeah, so he's he's actually built. They're just remote control airplane engines, and he essentially builds the airplanes because you can't just go out and buy remote control airplanes. That would be too cost prohibitive to be shooting those things down. But he kind of builds his own as inexpensively as possible. And, and he comes out there and he flies those things back and forth and he's probably putting one up every 15, 20 minutes or so and flying back and forth across the line and until somebody shoots it. So, and, and definitely the night shoots are, are what kind of people wait for a lot of times. So he throws some glow sticks on there and, and it makes it a little bit easier shooting at it with tracers. So that way you kind of see what you're shooting at, but it creates quite the, uh, quite the show when that thing's flying back and forth and everybody on that line is trying to shoot that thing down with their guns full of tracers. And it's neat to see the people that you can tell just from watching, you know, over the shoulders at night, the people that have had either a lot of personal experience shooting at those aerials or probably their uncle paid on the shoot at aerial targets because there's people <laughs> that are competent <laughs> at shooting those things yep. down. There's people that just have fun shooting. Yes, for sure. Um, and it's, it's definitely, it's very cool watching those things go back and forth. So now we're talking a quarter mile of guns. There's, I'm, I mean, I don't think anybody would try to count them all, but is there been any kind of attempts at figuring out like on an average, how many firearms are out at a shoot? Um, I haven't heard a number, but you got to, I mean, you figure that you, you've got so many, like I said, Sometimes. Or 10 or 12, and, and people aren't coming out there with one gun, generally yeah. speaking. Unless it's a uh, tank, right? And even if they bring a tank, they're bringing their guns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, even, you know, the people that are coming out there with their, their M250 calibers, they've got other yeah. smaller stuff, too, that they're out there. So, I mean, I'd probably say probably just on average, you got 10 to 15 guns per spot that people are shooting. Um, so, yeah, that definitely adds up to quite a bit. Um, I know they, they kind of keep track of... Uh, not really keep track, but probably ask more so about how many rounds are expended each shoot. And it's usually just under 2 million rounds for the weekend for everybody. So that's, that's a lot of rounds that people are shooting. It is. And think about how many of those are 50 BMGs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have a totally different opinion of 50s after 10, after being, you know, having the experience of Big Sandy, because you see them in gun shops and you go, oh, four or $5 a round. Like, not. Nah, if you know what you're doing, you don't have to pay four or five dollars around. These people are shooting; they're not shooting thousands and thousands and thousands around. They're dollars worth. You know, these guys are. Uh, anyway, there's there's definitely it's not like I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not like they're shooting as if they're shoot, 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 paying four bucks every time the hammer goes or the 
trigger, the firing pin goes down. Uh, they're, no, okay. they're and they're not going to Ellis and buying a box of twenty. You know, they're yeah, buying in bulk because it, it, it's it's a a no, like in other words, it's not like you're going to see a gun sitting there most of the weekend and it'll get shot. You know, one belt or something. These guys are burning barrels. I mean, they're just there's noise all yeah. day long. These these are not just photo opportunities. In fact. I guess that's something else we can talk about. I've been going for a while, and at the beginning, you had to. There was no video, and I guess that wasn't a big deal because there wasn't really video back in the first days of this stuff. But, but there was really no pictures unless you had the okay. And and I would there was some issue when I started posting pictures originally uh, because it wasn't you know the internet wasn't the way it was now, and YouTube wasn't you know a household name and stuff. So that's kind of changed. And I think that the I'm assuming the the people that show up to shoot are just more familiar and accustomed to the cameras. But now, I mean, there's about a billion cameras going on out, or a billion phones uh, recording stuff out there. So it's a, it's a whole different event as far as videos and stuff. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely, definitely changed over the years. Um, I mean, we still, people that are out there to make uh you know, media is treated a little differently than just somebody, a spectator out there with their phone. Yeah. And, and that's definitely everybody's out there, especially on the, some of the bigger stuff. And, and as it's, it's kind of evolved, it's gone from just machine guns. And I think we kind of mentioned it's gone to artillery pieces and tanks and cannons and stuff like that. So there's definitely spectators there waiting for, for those to go off when they start shooting those things. And that's got to be neat. I mean, you, you own a tank. You don't own a tank because you're going to shoot it in your backyard, you know, privately. You own it because you want to share that with everybody, right? So it's got to be fun for the guys that bring this big stuff. Yeah, no, they, they definitely enjoy what they're doing, um, the cannon guys and, and the guys that are bringing out the tanks and stuff. And, and they like to, to share. And, and and most people, to include them and everybody else, uh, for the spectators, are are typically happy to kind of explain what they have because there's just there's a ton of history up there too. It's not just like a bunch of new stuff. I mean, some of these guns that people are running are a hundred plus years old. So. That's a great point. Most of these are transferables, I'd say. I mean, there. Well, I can't say most of it. I'd say. Oh, I, was gonna, I think I'm going to say most of it is transferable. I think I can say that comfortably. There's certainly SOTs out there who are shooting, you know, modern stuff that they've created. Uh, that's not transferable to anybody, uh, but I'd say a good chunk of that stuff is transferable. These are just private individuals that bought their stuff before '86 or bought stuff that's transferable, and this is an opportunity to go shoot it again, not just out in the desert by yourself, which is kind of fun, but with other enthusiasts and people that appreciate it. At stuff, yeah, definitely that's incredible. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and and get distance too because it's you know going out in the desert unless it's sometimes it to get out to say 1200 yards on, on private or public land can be hard to do sometimes, especially when you're shooting a machine gun, drawing attention out there. Yeah. And then what are you going to shoot at steel targets? I mean, you're not going to bring a long, uh, you know, vehicle out there and we going to do that. So, uh, you know, again, you're going to be able to not just shoot your, your collection or your investment pieces, but be able to shoot them with friends at just incredible stuff. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you just come up and, and, bring your guns and your ammo and you set up your spot and just enjoy the shoot. The, uh, the targets are reset at every, at lunchtime and at dinner time. So like on Saturday, there's, there's a morning shoot, take a break for lunch. They re they go out there, reset all those target. Then there's an afternoon shoot, take a break for dinner. They reset targets and that's when they're putting out the fireworks and stuff like that. And then there's the night shoot after that. So, uh, it's not like the, the reactive targets are done in 20 minutes either. I mean, it's, it's going on all day. So let's talk about if most people that are, I'm assuming watching this and, and thinking about uh, going for the first time are not shooters. They've been not gone there already. And so we're not talking to the people that already are on the firing line. So if you're going or you're thinking about going as a spectator, um, I'm looking at a slide from the 2018 uh, gallery again, and this is from the East side of the line. Um, I don't know where this, you must have been on up on a pole or standing on some kind of something because it's basically uh, uh, right at the top where the 4-H is on the, you know, the east side looking west and looking at most of the firing line there and a bunch of the campers from the people that are uh, at the firing lines and you see 
I'm using my mouse here, but you'll see the uh, this big area. This is a time when there must have been, it's probably lunchtime or something, because everything's set up and it's daytime, but there's nobody standing around. So I'm guessing it's like lunchtime or something, or maybe during the ceasefire. So as a spectator, you show up and you uh, park wherever you want down in the uh, graded area that we showed you in that other picture. Um, I'm gonna, I guess I'm not going to try to find that other picture, but uh, you'll see that as you uh, park, there's everyone's going to be walking towards the shuttle. And down at the bottom end of the hill, or the bottom end of the hill, there's a tent there and a table, and you can sign up and uh, pay the 30 bucks to be a spectator. Mm -hmm. So you'll get a wristband. You have an opportunity to buy T-shirts. Each year they have a new T-shirt. And uh, you don't have stickers, I don't think, do you? Sometimes you have stickers. But you definitely have T-shirts. And then you can sometimes buy whatever stock they have of old shirts, which is cool. And that all supports the shoot, so I'd highly recommend it. It also promotes the shoot. So every time you go out to the range or to whatever event you're going to and you got a big Sandy shoot on, big Sandy shoot shirt on, you know, you're helping to promote this exercise in freedom. So highly recommend it. But as you sign in there, then you're free to do what you want. So now you're officially a spectator at the show. You can hang out at your camp and set it up if you want. Um, we'll talk about the schedule again, but basically there's three sh big shoots during Saturday and two on Friday and one on Sunday. Yes. There's, there's an afternoon shoot Friday, a night shoot Friday night, Saturday, there's a, a morning afternoon and night. And then Sunday morning, there's, there's a shoot for a couple hours um, to kind of let people finish up what they're doing and, and not, finish up. Not again. It, it's not as, not as, uh, I would say it's, less formal than the Saturdays for sure. Yeah, de definitely. A lot of, a lot of people do start packing up after uh, uh Saturday night. Um, and yeah, it's definitely kind of a lot more relaxed and they put a little bit of product out there, but, uh, but a lot less shooting and people are kind of winded down and getting ready to get out of there. So I am guess I'm describing as a spectator then, but I'm going to go back to that in a second. But as a spectator then, so you can show up whenever you want. There's no set time. So you can show up on Friday. Actually, I think I've showed up on Thursday before. I don't know if that's okay, but I've showed up on Thursday and just camped out because uh, you guys kind of start setting up on Thursday, right? Yeah, so, definitely. Um, the setup yeah, takes, takes a while for everybody. But yeah, uh, spectators can, uh, I believe they can show up on Thursday. I mean, I definitely. The, it was sort of like the first years you guys started doing the matches, which we'll also talk about in those take place on or start taking place on Friday. So I think I kind of just showed up to see what the matches were like and everything and to see, cause I kind of wanted to see the slow set startup instead of just getting there for the, for the meet of Saturday. Cause a lot of things yeah. you talk about a lot of spectators, I'm guessing a lot of them show up for the day on Saturday. And yeah, the, that's, that's the bulk yeah. of them definitely showing up for, for Saturday and staying for the, the night shoot and then heading out Saturday night. So that's uh, an option. So this is, again, about an hour or something. Eh, was it two hours from Phoenix? If you're right downtown Phoenix and you left in maybe two hours, maybe an hour, something. Uh, yeah, downtown Phoenix, it's probably two and a half okay. um, from downtown. Yeah. I'm coming from Tucson, so I never really know where, where Phoenix. But it's about similar from Vegas, maybe, maybe three from Vegas. Uh, yeah, I want to say it's it, it's within a half an hour as far as difference like it might be just yeah half an hour more so if you vegas. have to vegas, if you're in vegas or doing something you know you live around anywhere like that um so anyway if you show up as a spectator like i say you can just uh sign in grab a shirt uh set up camp or whatever there's porta potties down there uh, plenty of people usually there's pretty good you know it's just like any kind of camping any kind of event where there's camping uh, <laughs> like, a, like a concert or something uh, so then you can take the shuttles, they're free, and they kind of just happen all day long. Uh, the, there's like a shuttle that'll take, you know, depends on the vehicle, but however many people it can take up and down the hill, so you don't have to take that uh, climb up the hill. Once you're at the top of the hill, it'll drop you off right at the 4-H place, so you can get something to eat. Like we said, l breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They kind of, they're there all the time, but the, they set up for food, and then they close it down. So, you know, be there for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's not like there's always food there. But I think they might have always, they always have like drinks and snacks maybe uh yeah they might there's there's a two or three hour block for each uh each meal if you will and then because then after that's done then they're cleaning up and they're prepping yeah. for that next meal because they're, so. they're out there. it's not like they're catering these in i mean they're cooking it right there like i said they do a good job so oh yeah yeah no, yeah they cater it all there or they they cook it all there for you and then you're welcome to just walk around so that's what it's about it's not a um an amusement park where there's like things to do and there's like stations or something and there's 
I mean, there's plenty of blind range safety officers. There's plenty of people in the, um, uh, you know, that are aware of what's going on to keep the thing, the facilitating the whole thing. You're welcome to talk to them for sure. Uh, they know what's going on and they're enthusiastic about it. Uh, but then it's, I mean, look at all the tents in this picture that we're showing. These are each individual. Some of them are stores. Some of them are individuals. Some of them are just people that have been shooting here for a long time. Almost all of them are interested in having a conversation uh, or got something to talk about or you have a question. Uh, obviously, if somebody's in the middle of something or, you know, they're having an issue with a $10,000 gun or something, that's not the time to ask them a question. But um, most of the time, uh, it's just the, the stories, the the information, the questions are just, it's its a fun day. You kind of walk up and down as a spectator uh, and see the different guns that are going on, see some of the conversations. Um, we see guns a lot of times in movies as like these things that either work perfectly or they never work or they're accurate or they're never accurate. And in real life, they're just like every other car or sewing machine or guitar or skateboard you've ever had. And people are having issues and people are running them flawlessly and people are bragging about them and, you know, selling and trading and just doing everything you do is, you know, people that are interested in the, um, in a, in a facet like this. Now on the other side of this little walkway, uh, you can see there's a couple of tents set up and that's not a, again, it's not a gun show and it's not a swap meet, but do people do show up usually that have either something for sale, uh, interesting things, useful things, gun show type of stuff. Uh, there's been stuff like nose art from airplanes and that kind of things. There's uh, one of my favorite things to buy there. I'll bring money. I always bring cash. One of my favorite things to buy is the aerial parachutes or aerial flares, I guess. From what I understand, the lifeboats that use those aerial flares, they, you know, by law or something, they have to cycle them through. They can't be anywhere near their expiration date or something, you know, for safety. So the old ones, they bring up, you know, places will bring, that source those, bring them up. And they're nothing. They're like $3 or something. And how fun is it? Where else in the world can you just go pop an aerial like incendiary flare <laughs> and not have to worry yeah. about it. And you're actually adding to the um, uh, ambience of the whole thing. So if you've got a kid, I can't tell you how happy kids are to go to the big Sandy shoot, experience the full auto, the tannerite, the smell. We, I mean, we have to talk about the smell of cordite all day long. It's amazing. Yep. And then it'll give a little kid an aerial flare to shoot off where they just yank a pin and a flare goes shooting off and they get to see it rise kind of slowly into the air and light up a bunch of machine guns. Yeah, that's that's the next generation, the second amendment right there. So I'm trying to describe what you do as a, as a spectator. There's plenty to do, but you're not going to your hands not going to be held. You go there with the intent of exploring our second amendment and the people that enjoy it. And and I just wanted to put that out there. It's not like there's a bunch of bleachers and you're going to sit down and there's going to be like somebody at a porpoise show explaining everything to you. You get to actually go experience a little bit of what it would be like if a gun show was out in the middle of nowhere and everybody could shoot at it. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably a good kind of uh, um, way to describe it as, as a gun show where people are, are actually able to go shoot. Um, there There's definitely some, there are some vendors up there that, that pay to come up there and, and they are, there are people selling, selling something. Some of it's kind of geared towards the shooters, but there's definitely uh, people selling ammo uh, and stuff like that. I, I don't think there's, there's not people selling guns. But, no, no. Uh, well, I guess when I said selling guns, that's like when you see it. Two yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. trade you Browning for three M16s. Like you get to see that kind of stuff happen. Yeah, um, but yeah, for the, as far as the uh, the spectator experience, definitely, um, it's uh, as you mentioned, it's kind of the fire line is kind of up on a hill, and the registration and camping and everything is down below. So yeah, that that shuttle bus is running back and forth uh, all day long, and it's it's maybe only a few hundred yard walk up the hill to to the shooting line so you don't have to take the shuttle if you don't want to and it's not like it's a super far distance um but uh but there is also a a rental booth available for that's open to spectators that's run by the the big sandy shoot and in the rental booth spectators can come and they can there's a whole just a, a little wall of of guns that they they have available to rent and you can come in and rent a you know get a magazine or whatever for for that gun and they got a spot in the line there so so the spectators are able to shoot and they can even shoot machine guns uh if they choose to do so up there so it's not like you just don't have to do anything and you can just stand there and watch and not touch anything so if you want to that that is available too that's a great point i didn't even think about mentioning that we have taken you up on that and it's a neat 
experience because it's kind of right in the center of the line. So it's not like it's over on the side or anything. You get you definitely get the authentic experience of pulling the trigger on a full auto at all the targets we just talked about. And, you know, we've seen some of these pictures like overhead and stuff. But imagine standing on that firing line and just having a big mountain that you can shoot at anything. And some of the things you shoot at are going to explode. Um, you're not only going to shoot that, but you're just going to be belt fed stuff going off, you know, constantly from both sides of you. So, you know, unlike maybe if you went to Vegas and rented a gun, which I recommend doing, uh, but, you know, you're going to have a, a, an ambiance that you're never going to experience anyplace else on the planet. And the, the cost isn't that much. I mean, I've been to plenty of places that rent machine guns and I mean, I don't know what they are now, but there's no way you've gone up and priced that much a, 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 a full mag. Unlike some places that give you a couple of rounds, like a full mag was definitely comparable to any place in Vegas. And you're not shooting at drums and machine of uh, Tannerite and uh, dynamite in Vegas. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and it's, it's largely just the, the cost of the ammo and it, it depends on what, what gun it is in at that rental booth. They've got everything from, uh, from MP fives to Thompson's to AKs to M 16s. And then down, down down into the belt fed, whether they're Brownie nineteen nineteens or uh, full on. There's always a an M two fifty caliber machine gun there uh, that you can shoot, and uh, plenty of ammo to you know, however much your heart desires. I'm gonna stop on this slide, and we're at the west end of the line, looking probably from a drone or somebody stuck something up on a pole or something. But we're looking back east, and you can kind of see when. Even when you're at the edge of this thing, you, you can't see the whole firing line because it kind of wraps around this kind of crescent shape and everybody's kind of shooting over here. Um, we should talk about the matches. So there's, you know, we have pre-fire shoot uh, of range times. You know, so the, the shoot was originally a bunch of people that got together and went shooting. As it grew and more people showed up, it evolved, right? So as it evolved into multiple days, uh, like you say, you you can't just shoot at targets, you know. They're not magic. They, you have to go reset them. So the, the I imagine after it grew to multiple days, you had to grow to multiple sessions, or you know, range times. And then you know, the ceasefires work pretty good for eating lunch and everything. Um, but now that it starts on Friday and it ends on Sunday, in addition to just the live fire sessions, which you consider two on Friday, three on Saturday, and then that one on Sunday. There's also matches, and are there still, um, like, what would be the word, like, uh, wasn't there, like, uh, what's the word, like, uh, um, familiarization shoots or something where you guys would just kind of shoot some guns and talk about them? Uh, yeah, so they do, there's a total of uh, five matches that go on during the, uh, for the weekend, they're on Friday and Saturday, and the matches are open to, to everybody now, they're, whether they're shooters or spectators, and uh, they're they're called matches, and there's definitely some uh, competitiveness in there, but it's not like a they're not real formal. They're more they're fun matches, is what they are. They're for for people to go out there and have fun and, and do something a little different, and and for like for the shooters, for example, that are coming from the line, there there's a lot to do out there at the line, but they got to stay in their little shooting area and they can't do anything whereas at on the matches we've got a uh, a little trench line and it's kind of a you kind of get to run and shoot your gun a little bit and they're there yeah and you don't need a full auto either to shoot this so it is a machine gun shoot and you can definitely use full auto guns for the matches but if you're a spectator and you don't have a thompson or an m16 or a bar or something you don't need that you can bring up your 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 other guns too um and the matches that they run there's a military bolt action match so obviously that one is you know 1903s and enfields and uh 1917s or most of or whatever whatever people bring up there there's an assault rifle which is going to be your m16s ar-15s uh bar things like, like that then there's a there's a subgun match that uh is is usually you know the MP5s, the Thompsons, the Uzis, things like that, and then finally there's a well then there's the Grand match, which is specific to the the M1 Grand, and and that's done on the trench line, and you kind of get to run and 
shoot some steel targets down in the wash there. And then the final one is a sniper match that uh, is is typically bolt action. I think there's definitely people probably using semi-autos too, but that one you get to shoot out to, I think, 600 yards, I think is the uh, the distance on that sniper match. So, and it's, and again, they're not, they're not super competitive. Um, it's more just kind of a time for people to go up there and kind of have fun and do something a little different and allow the spectators to shoot too if, if they want to bring up their stuff and have some fun. So. Yeah, it's awesome that it's evolving. And like you say, even when you have the opportunity to shoot at this distance and at cool targets, yeah, you're still kind of restricted that you got to sit there. So it's cool that, you know, the it's evolving to let them uh, have a little bit more, I don't know, time to get all the grand people together, for example, because there's some neat stuff that shows up that isn't necessarily NFA just because these people are gun people. Uh, so, yeah, being able to... Uh, uh, shoot a little bit interactively move around yeah no it's it's fun and, and people just kind of enjoy doing it uh and you know round counts aren't aren't real high they're they're fairly low maybe a magazine or two for for the most part or um you know two or three clips of uh for the grand stuff like that so it's it's just kind of a fun time to get out there and, and let people shoot and it's it's also kind of nice actually because it's off of the main firing line where the matches are so it's being out that fire line constantly with all those explosions and all this gun shooting. It's actually kind of a nice break to go up there and relax a little bit and not have uh, that constant gunfire sometimes and let your, your head take a break a little bit. I was going to say, it's also like an opportunity for everybody to kind of just kind of shoot the shit a little bit. Cause when everybody's on their, in their own, you know, pop-ups or on their own point of the line doing their thing, you're not having a conversation, you know, you're not able to just, you know, do the nerd stuff and, you know, ask about this stock or that, you know, how does this site work in there? Where do you source that piece that I can't find? Yeah, definitely. There's definitely some uh, camaraderie and, you know, conversations while people are waiting their turns to do the match because it's definitely uh, easier to have a conversation up there than it is down to the firing line with, with all that stuff going on. And, and I'm gonna, I don't know how to, first of all, we're looking at a slide now of one of the mules. Is there more than one mule out there? I think there is. I think I've seen more than one, but we're looking at a mule, the flatbed uh, yep. transport uh, from, I don't know, 60s? And uh, uh, yeah. yeah, just need to experience them. But anyway, it's one of the things you guys use to drag, you know, the, literally the high explosives and out to the, the firing line and stuff. So any, you talked about like millions, what, how many millions of rounds? Uh, just under 2 million, I think is the normal number, generally speaking, that, that are expended at each shoot. So any idea how much on the other end of the target side, like how many, mm -hmm. how do you calculate how much, or is there, how do you quantify how much of the stuff, like is it by pounds or by crates? Um, I don't know. And I couldn't tell you exactly how much product is actually put out there for, uh, for the, for the reactive targets, but I will tell you that generally speaking at the end of, uh, or not, I, I would probably say all the time at the end of the shoots, we got to go back out there and pull some of it back in because it doesn't all get shot. So it's, it's still out there. So there's, I was wondering about that. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's like, I, uh, it all shut yeah. up and then everybody's kind of just sitting there with nothing to do. I mean, there's, you, you got to kind of start looking for them as, as the shoots go on. But, uh, so it gets replenished at every break, and then you can just kind of go out there and keep shooting that stuff. That's what I was going to ask. So I don't really – I've never tried to keep track. Are the targets in the same general places each time so people know where they should be, or did people watch as you're setting them up, or is it literally sort of a peck in – or is it a, a, an Easter egg hunt? You're trying to find them out there at the same time that you're – um, it's, it's race when this when the line will start like i know a bunch of the sniper guys have them in their sights because as soon as the whistle blows like boom 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 like a bunch of them go off people have kind of you know sighted in on them or something and then um, it's, it's a peck and or kind of a race to see who can find them all yeah no we uh so people have started bringing up scoped rifles for uh for the shoots and stuff because as, as you mentioned there are a lot of these people are just gun people in general so they've got machine guns and scoped rifles and everything. We do, we do ask that, uh, the people with the scoped rifles wait half an hour. Does that oh. always happen? Probably not. But, uh, to kind of give those people with the machine guns time to time to shoot that stuff. But on that same token, I mean, these people, 
a lot of these people have these machine guns and been coming up here for years, so they know how to use their machine guns, especially on a tripod. So you go yeah. out there and you pick, you pick one on that tripod and you know how to work that gun. It's not going to be too hard to hit one of them. Uh, but as far as for picking them out, the uh, the the sticks of dynamite are all stuck on wooden stakes in the ground, and that kind of what that kind of does is kind of keeps keeps that uh, that reactive target up off the ground, so it's not kicking a lot of dirt and rocks and stuff possibly back towards the firing line. That kind of uh, buffers that a little bit. Uh, but because they're stuck up on those stakes, it, it allows you to see them, and you, and you can you can identify those stakes out there. And then what we do at night is we actually tape a glow stick onto that reactive target, so that way everybody can see it. So it's it's actually pretty cool, even before the the uh, the night shoot gets started. You know, you go out there and you just see the sea of glow sticks out there, and I mean it's it's hundreds of them, and uh, all just with a stick of dynamite on there waiting waiting to be shot. It's such a it, it's such a neat potential. There's no way to to explain it because you know it's coming. Yeah, definitely, and and definitely that's that Saturday night shoot is is definitely hard to hard to explain. It's definitely something you kind of got to get up there and experience for sure. And, and even the videos on YouTube and stuff, there's you could tell it's definitely cool, but actually being there and seeing it and feeling it and smelling it and everything is is very unique. And that's something that I don't know if there's any way to describe. I've been in the military. I didn't do anything hardcore or nothing, but you know, just in initial basic training and stuff you're on lines with a bunch of people shooting and i've been to um what do they call like uh reenactments where they'll bomb a beach and stuff so i've seen some ordnance like that go off and it's pretty impressive but literally i mean i'm not even just nothing can compare with the i mean the night shoot the afternoon shoot those are hours it seems like hours is it it's got to be more than an hour of just constant belt fed and explosions going off and like you say the the feeling the 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 concussions the constant disruption of the air is just a it's just in, it's amazing and it's a there's no way to really describe that it, the way that it happens for so long um definitely bring ear pro that's for sure but uh the smell i mean the dynamite the fireworks the flares the tracers and then the gunpowder not to mention all the oils and stuff that are cooking off. It's better than any barbecue, right? I mean, there's no way to describe that. I mean, whatever you've experienced shooting. The only thing you're missing, I guess, is we don't get a lot of black. Oh, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say that we're missing some black powder, but those cannons that shoot the uh, bowling balls, that's all. Yeah, yeah they've got those. Uh, I think a lot of them are actually like scuba tanks and stuff like that, or, or some, some sorts of not scuba tanks, but... Types of tanks, yeah, they've converted into cannons, and yeah, they're just pouring a bunch of black powder in there and launching uh, bowling balls out there into the uh, into the firing area. So that's always neat. And at night, when they'll launch a bowling ball full of light sticks, glow sticks, and like just lob it up there, and you kind of watch it slowly go up and just travel, and you know, but it just looks like it's slowly moving up there and comes down. Yep. And like you talked about, I've seen you know somebody shoot a, a fifty tracer; it'll wing off and hit some. I'm trying to find a spot where they show the the side of the hill again. But I've seen uh, guys when they're shooting their fifties, the bell fed M twos. You know, they'll see a tracer fly off and just be an outlier burning somewhere. And these guys can just swing their tripod down and modus over at it, and in like two little pumps, just nail that tracer. It is neat seeing somebody who knows how to use a machine gun uh, have fun with a machine gun on a hillside like that. It's yeah, like, and we'll we'll actually use that sometimes. Uh, be being out in the in the desert, obviously, sometimes fire can be an issue. Um, but we'll actually, and it's usually typically at night with the uh, with the tracers. So we'll actually use uh, fifty calibers that aren't using tracers to shoot those fires. And actually, put the fires out with more mm. gunfire by just kicking up the dirt around and, and spreading that fire out and around and, and getting it put out to try to not have to shut the line down because of a fire. Exactly. And I guess the, the guys that are, they're familiar with that. And like you say, they, they know, it and they just kind of, it just happens. It's taken care of by the line as it's happening. Yep. Okay. So we've been digging in for a while and I guess we've been going for an hour. Hopefully we've got a little bit more time because there are some questions coming in. I want to uh, let people that are watching and try to keep this interactive as possible. So, uh, we got a couple minutes to answer some questions. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Pants on the Gun Channel side is asking, I may have already covered it, but is there a swap meet kind of thing going on at Big Sandy? 
And that's a good question. I think that there's been kind of fits and starts of doing an actual gun show out there, but there's almost always something. Yeah, there there was a gun show out there one time. Uh, I don't really know what the deal. Uh, there hasn't been one out there recently, uh, but there is. There's definitely there's vendors out there uh, selling some stuff uh, with target stands, stuff like that, um, and ammunition, things like that. But as far as a a swap meet, there's not really anything formal, if you will, with that. Um, I'm a ammo collector, so I've I. One of my favorite things about going to Big Sandy, I kind of showed the side of it before, is this uh, ammo munitions, I guess, ordinance company uh, comes up uh, fairly regularly. Not every single time, but most of the time I think I've been there, they've been there. And they'll sell things like inert mines and uh, big ordinance, I don't know, mortars. I don't know what the big stuff is, but, you know, the inert stuff, it's just neat to you know have it in ordinance collection. Uh, but then the ammo. Uh, both live and inert, but just uh, exotic stuff and interesting stuff and collectible stuff. So, uh, like you say, some of the stuff that they sell um, would be in bulk for the guys that are shooting. Like maybe they didn't bring enough tracer or whatever. They ran out of something so they can pick up some supplies. Uh, but as a collector, there's all kinds of interesting stuff. There's been some artwork. Um, it's not like a gun show. I mean, there's no beef jerky and stuff like that, but... Uh, I definitely bring money though. And like you say, there's the rental and you might not think, yeah, big rental, big deal, but you go there and you're standing on the line, you might want to scratch that itch. And it's not that much. Bring a hundred bucks though, because you might want to scratch that itch a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely and it's it's worth it. If especially if you've never shot a full auto anything, it's I mean it's worth it. Um, and I wanted to also bring up that uh it's an opportunity. So uh I've had I mean I I can't to describe. I've been kind of thinking about it as you were talking before and as we're looking through the pictures, but um, my experience with firearms is a lot of it has, um, a lot of my interests have come from what I've discovered at Big Sandy. So because of the environment as a spectator, uh, you're welcome to, uh, to walk around the firing line and experience what it's like while everybody's doing their thing. And because there's the, 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 ceasefires, the times for lunch and everything when everybody's um, either maintaining or cleaning or setting up or doing their thing with whatever guns, actually not on the line during the ceasefires, but, um, you know, they'll be uh, maybe doing maintenance and stuff on, you know, on their, in their campers or whatever. But there's so many conversations to be had and um, so many people and so, uh, to meet and so many firearms to talk about. The, the, you know, like you say, hundreds of years old guns, modern stuff, weird stuff. Um, I was going to ask, do you have a favorite or is there a gun that you try to shoot each time or uh, you've been going for quite a few years now. Has there been anything that stands out in a show like this or a shoot like this that's full of standouts? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff and everybody, everything has their, their nuances that are, that are cool and interesting. Um, but as far as I, I would say, you know, full auto belt fed stuff that, that 50 caliber, like there's, and I think you mentioned, there's just nothing like that thing. There's the, the feel of shooting that thing and, and even seeing that thing shoot. It's just, it's something else and it's a sight to behold and it's pretty cool. I mean, I've seen, seen tanks shoot before. I've seen real tanks shoot real ordnance before. I've seen, like I was saying, like fake stuff at a, reenactments and i've seen demos and things uh but stan i've never stood next to a tank like that i mean i don't even know if, how many people on the planet get to stand that close to a tank and in a recreational setting it's even fewer but that's pretty amazing the full out of 1911 was it uh, uh bob i think had a video or ed had a video up with that 1911 for many years that full auto 1911 that there's very few of those and he had they had like a legit one out or is it his or they had a legit one out there one year yeah uh yeah i'm not sure who uh who had that or whatever but uh but yeah there's there's a lot of stuff out there and it's definitely it's definitely cool uh, i've seen people shooting sturm gewehrs you know real ones that's kind of neat just so you can see one and then see people actually enjoying it and using it Yep, definitely, definitely. There's there's some of those out there. Sometimes, a lot of the belt fed stuff is is also super old. Um, Bars, Thompsons, Uzis, uh, 
M3 grease guns, all that, all that fun stuff that you get to see, see in the movies and on TV shows and stuff. You can actually kind of come out and, and see somebody mm. shooting those things in real life. See them shooting it, but then, like I say, there's that opportunity that if it's the right person and it's the right time and, and you know, it's the everything lines up and, and it's not that rare for that everything to line up but again you can uh ask somebody what's it like to acquire that uzi like how did you get that uzi and i i usually ask people this question especially stuff like the mod deuces i know people that bought mod deuces from fn pre-86 so just went to the store said hey i want the same m2 that the military uses and they said okay here it is you know it's yeah cool <laughs> but it's an interesting story and it's just neat to talk to people who have done that these people are not rich well, I guess some of them are, but a lot of people have this perception that all full of auto people are rich. Most of them, most of the people I know at least, just bought their guns pre-86 and bought them like they would buy any other gun and enjoy shooting them. But, uh, I mean, there are definitely people that are wealthy that can afford to jump into the game now. But most of the people, especially the people at Big Sandy, it seems have been just in the game since pre-86 and just were doing this probably before that, just not at the same scale. And with you know the the community community aspect of it, but um, again the, the 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 conversations you can have. I talked to a guy one time. You know I do YouTube stuff, so I guess it's a little different because I'll you know ask people questions because I'm trying to get videos or trying to learn stuff. Uh, but I talked to a guy for a long time about his uh, Gatling gun. And that was just a you know I, where else are you going to get an opportunity to talk to somebody who owns one, you know, and and just hear about the frustrations and the, the fun part of it, but mostly the frustrations of owning this thing. And you, you when you see it just fire, it's kind of, uh, it's only one-sided, you know, and then Big Sandy gives you an opportunity if you're truly a gun person to really see what it's like to to be involved in this stuff and the frustrations and the, and now with the laws and everything, I'm really looking forward to seeing what kind of, you know, ever hearing what some of the conversations are up on the hill as the ceasefires happen and Again, you've got an opportunity, unlike a gun show where it's all commerce and you're there to do your thing. And if you're not buying something, you're probably annoying them. So you're going to keep walking. And, you know, unless there's like a concession area at the gun shop or something that's specifically set up to, to you know, to, to start conversations or, to, you know, foster conversations, you're really there just to do commerce. With uh, the Big Sandy shoot there, you're, of course, there to shoot or to spectate. But in those ceasefires, you have an opportunity. You just don't get anywhere else because unlike a gun show where everybody's done doing the thing they're there for, everybody leaves. No one disperses. You know, there's one, there's nowhere to go, but there's no reason to go anywhere because there's still stuff happening there. Uh, those booths that we talked about that are selling stuff, you know, you can still go browse around through there uh, if they're open. And then all the shooters, you know, not everybody's there to entertain you, but they're certainly there as human beings to have conversations if you've got a question or something. And again, you get just so much more insight about everything about uh, the Second Amendment, firearms ownership, uh, recreational use, and the experience of people that own these things instead of just uh, seeing them on TV. Yeah, definitely. Um, and there's, as we mentioned, there's definitely a lot of a lot of history in there. I mean, some of these some of these guns too have uh, provenance along with them that were bring back from wars and stuff like that. So that that's a possibility, and some of those conversations can certainly be had. And and as you mentioned, the frustrations of kind of running these things because. A lot of the stuff is old and you know you can't just go out and get parts for a Sturm Gewehr or 1919 or anything like that you can't go to the store and buy those things uh so trying to get things working sometimes takes a little bit for sure now it looks like my instagram hit an hour so we left the 64 people that were watching over there but uh thanks i guess i'm saying thanks to nobody because it's over over there it's ended over there but um thanks to the people that were watching us live on the other chat the big sandy shoot happens twice a year mg shooters is dot com is the name of the website and that's where people can go to um find out about the shoots and schedule them if you want to shoot that's where you sign up for registration if you want to shoot in one of the matches that's where you register as well right uh yeah you can pre-register at this point um especially for spectators just show up and and do the registration and you can you can register for the the matches there and it's it's one fee for all of the matches too which is nice uh so and i let me just double check to make sure uh yeah 25 dollars, and you can shoot in all five matches if you wanted so uh it's not expensive to to get in there and be a part of that and, and do something a little more than just watch while you're up there um, I'd also encourage anybody that is watching this and thinks it's neat, if you know somebody in the area, 
let them know about it. Don't assume that they know about it. If you know a gun shop, don't assume that they participate in it. Uh, this is an opportunity for gun shops to meet up with some of the hardest of core Second Amendment people, some of the most interested uh, you know, shooters out there, people that are learning, people that uh, you know are maybe making the decision to start some NFA stuff. So if you've been thinking about getting into the NFA game, I can't imagine a better place to to go and, and get a gathering of people that are truly involved in the NFA items, uh, everything about them, acquiring them, shooting them, maintaining them. And then of course, if you're at the stand to shoot, you'll have a place to shoot them. Um, but again, if you know somebody in the Vegas area, in the, in the Phoenix area, uh, I know people that have come from California before, uh, let them know about the shoot. It happens twice a year and so often they hear about it from the coverage afterwards. And we're trying to do this ahead of time uh, you know, to let people know so that they actually get an opportunity to shoot it. The weather is awesome right now in Arizona. Um, like we said, it's a little bit rainy, but nowhere near as bad as it's been in some years. So I'm assuming the shoot's going to have, uh, or I mean, the weather's going to be pretty nice next weekend. It's the next weekend already, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the first, uh, a week from today is when it starts. Um, yeah, and weather, yeah, I think weather should be good. It's been, like, as you mentioned, raining a little bit, but it should be done with that and Nice weather and should be nice and uh, green up there too, probably with all the rain we've had. So, I don't know if I, if there was anything else you wanted to uh, to make sure we hit. Um, no, I think uh, I think we got most things that are kind of going on up there. So I think it was a good coverage of what what we got going. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. It's tough because you're you're not you know you're not just working for the big sand. You've got a nine to five. You're doing this additionally. So thank you for taking the time to. To provide a shoot like this, I hope you um, uh, take you know offer that to everybody else who's involved in the the project. We've got the people that uh, took it from a, a informal shoot on public land uh, that created a, a, a entity or a structure for it and uh, bought some land so that it can be done on private land and and scale to the size it's scaled to. I can't imagine where it's going to be able to go based on their efforts there, the line safety officers, the fire people, we didn't talk about that. Of course, there's emergency people on hand, the 4-H people that feed us, uh, all the people that work who don't even get to watch the line that are working in the tent down below, you know, selling the t-shirts and um, getting the, the, the spectators up the hill, the people on the shuttle. A lot of effort goes into this, people that are just, you know, there to make sure that the thing happens. And again, they're not even getting to see the event every year. So thanks. Hopefully we'll relay that to everybody. And sure. again, uh, thanks for showing up and, and telling us about it. And um, oh, I just wanted to throw out there, if you are planning attending, if you are planning to attend, if you fly into Phoenix or Vegas and rent a car and head over there, uh, drink, bring lots of water. It's high elevation. It might get you. Uh, it's dry. So bring lots of water, bring some sunscreen if you need it. Uh, chapstick is always good. Uh, one of those little tiny folding chairs. Uh, we're looking at the main page of the website with their uh, picture on the main page, and you'll see the aerial fireworks going off on the hillside in the background, but in the foreground, everybody's sitting in those little folding kind of chairs that pop open like an umbrella. Highly recommend something like that, and that way it's a little more comfortable for you. Uh, the 4-H is there, but if you want to bring your own water or something, remember you're camping out there. Uh, so just to make your experience uh, as comfortable as possible. I just thought I'd throw some of that stuff out there for anybody that might be visiting from outside of our climate. Uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, thanks again, Trevor, for showing up and having a uh, chat with uh, us. Look forward to saying hey out at the shoot next weekend. And of course, we'll be uh, covering it and letting people know after the fact what it was like this year. Cool. Sounds good. I appreciate it. Awesome. So let's, I'll talk to you. I'll say hey next weekend. And uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up. And uh, we'll be back a little bit later for our daily gun show every weeknight uh, right after this. Uh, or actually, Gary has probably started his foul territory. Uh, he does his Friday podcast uh, over on gun channels. And uh, thanks for the questions. See you next time.